Hello there. In this video, I'm going to look at some of the missing details that weren't included in the film The Bang Bang Club. The movie is a biopic about a group of four photographers that covered the violence during the last years of apartheid in South Africa. Unfortunately, I think the film tried to be too many things to too many people and landed up being fairly bland. The real life story was actually strong enough, so you didn't really need a Hollywood coating to make it work. And I think the book is far stronger than the film, but what the film actually does do well is provide the actual scenes where the events happened. It's obviously tricky for a director to compress events and personalities that were involved in this over five years into a sort of hour and a half movie. I'll try to provide some insight into the complexity of the situation that led to these four photographers forming a tightly knit team and also look at the events that unfolded from 1989 through to 1994. The 1990s were a complex and unpredictable time in South Africa's history. Although the battle to end apartheid was about white versus black, the violence mainly involved black people killing other black people, and this can be quite confusing for outsiders to work out. Most of the violence occurred between two political parties, the African National Congress and the Nkata Freedom Party. It played itself out predominantly where hostels were located and the Nkata were mainly residents of the hostels. I read one film review and it said that the film covered four frat boys that decided to get involved in shooting the violence. The script might have led one to believe that, but it wasn't the case at all. All four members of the Bang Bang Club were outsiders like the rest of us that were covering the violence, and no self-respecting fraternity would have accepted any of us. Basically, one teamed up with other photographers to share resources and to feel just a little bit safer in these violent circumstances. Joao Silva, Greg Murdovich, Kevin Carter, and Ken Osterbrook made up the Bang Bang Club. There was never actually a club. They just happened to move around in the townships together. A editor of a local South African magazine called Lifestyle Magazine, his name was Chris Marais, wrote a story about this group of photographers. The first article was titled The Bang Bang Paparazzi, but then later the name shifted to The Bang Bang Club. If that was the limit to the story, then I think they would have faded into history. However, two of them won Pulitzers, one was shot dead, one committed suicide, one later had his legs blown off by a landmine, and Marinovich and Silva wrote a book of the same name, The Bang Bang Club. That's why I actually say their story was strong enough to hold the attention of an audience for an hour and a half. <laughs> At the time, the members of the group mostly found their celebrity status that they had achieved a bit uncool. But for the rest of us, it provided fodder for ridicule. Generally though, the press was fairly supportive to each other. There was one incident that I think appeared in the book. My colleague Paul Velasco and I were covering violence near a hostel. 
and shooting broke out and I drove quickly towards cover behind a wall. The Bang Bang Club guys were in front of us and one, a hanger-on from the States jumped out of the car and shouted, stop following us, stop following us, <laughs> which is the worst thing to say <laughs> to Paul because he had anger management issues anyway. So my main motive was to get away from the shooting, but Paul in the sort of bullets were flying either way and Paul gets out and said, well, I'll put it nicely, but we wouldn't follow you if you were the last people alive, but he used a lot more colorful language. Greg Marinovich won the Spot News Pulitzer Prize in 1991. I'm not going to show the image because YouTube will censor the video, but you can Google it and take a look. At that time, Greg and I were moving around quite often together, and on that morning he called me up and said, do I want to join him? But I said, no, I can't. I've agreed to go shopping with my wife. Then on Monday morning, I was in the Reuters office and we were all staring down at this amazingly powerful image that was on the front page. And I remember the chief photographer, Uli Michel, just looked at it and said, Pulitzer. As a favor to Robin Comley, I feel I better clear this scene up. This part of the movie was 100% Hollywood. Robin and Greg never had a thing going on. At the time, Greg had a very serious girlfriend. As the violence ramped up, so did the self-medication, and generally there was a sense that we were in a bit of a twilight zone. It was very hard to stay grounded in reality because one was leading a kind of schizophrenic life. One would be immersed in the violence during the day and the chaos, and then you'd kind of return to the suburbs in the evening and try act normal. Life became more unreal as fellow photographers began to die. The first was a very gentle newcomer called Abdul Sharif. He was killed in the crossfire in Katlahong Township outside Johannesburg. Then in April 1994, 10 days before the historic elections were due to be held, Ken Osterbrook was shot and killed by members of the peacekeeping force. They hadn't received much training and they were just put in the township to try create order. Greg was also shot with a high velocity assault rifle round to his chest, his hand and his buttocks. My colleague Paul Velasco and I had been covering the same events earlier that day, but we had to rush to the airport to ship film. And then when we were driving back, we heard that Ken had died. Kevin was a very sensitive soul and was probably better suited to being a radio DJ, which he had been on a popular radio station and he played on a Sunday night. He, he played laid back music kind of to get stoned to or for a seduction. Ken's death hit him really hard and then he received a huge amount of flack after his vulture and child shot won the Pulitzer. He went into a downward spiral and eventually committed suicide. The media ironically contributed to his sense of shame and guilt. I think Joao accurately sums up the actual facts of the situation. Joao continued covering hard news, spending the first decade of this century rotating through Afghanistan and Iraq for the New York Times. It was in Afghanistan that he stepped on a landmine and he lost both his legs and suffered serious internal injuries. For more than three years, he underwent a series of operations, but he survived and slowly returned to shooting. Greg managed to get wounded on four separate occasions and he still tosses and turns at night because of birdshot that is lodged beneath his skin. After revealing the police involvement in a 2012 massacre, Greg felt that he and his family were under threat and they left the country. He now teaches photography at a Harvard Extension School and film at Boston University. I hope this video provided a broader context to the emergence of the Bang Bang Club and the events that followed. 
If you want to get more information on Kevin Carter and his Vulture image, please click on the above link. And thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you.